Hi everyone, and welcome back to Wine Unpacked. I'm Holly, and I'm your teacher, your guide, and your private sommelier for the next hour or so. In this lesson, we're gonna be learning about a few different grapes with some similar sounding names. Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Sauvignon Blanc. We'll throw in a couple of others for good measure too. You've probably noticed that we've got a mix of label colors today. The yellows are white wines and the reds are reds. You'll want to make sure the yellow ones are nicely chilled before we start, so pop them in the freezer for 10 minutes before we get going, if you haven't been keeping them in the fridge. You can open the reds now as well to get a bit of air to them. Oh, and one more thing. Later on in this lesson, you'll probably want some snacks. Some cured meat would be perfect, or if you don't eat meat, perhaps some hard cheese. And if you don't eat cheese, maybe some nuts or some crisps. You'll see why shortly. Once your wines are cold and you're sitting comfortably and you have some glasses in front of you, we're ready to get going. So, today's grapes and their names. Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Sauvignon Blanc. They're all pretty similar, so what's the deal there? Well, when grapes are grown, producers don't actually take seeds and plant them and wait for them to grow, like you might have done if you've ever tried growing your own fruit and veg. Instead, what commercial vine growers do is take a cutting of the plant, which means they cut a piece of a vine off and pop it in the ground, more or less. This cutting will then flourish into a vine, which will be a clone of the parent plant, so they can be sure that it'll grow exactly the same variety of grapes. If the vines are left of their own devices to pollinate, they'll produce an offspring of a new variety. That's how vines have evolved over the years and why we have so many different grape varieties today. Our first wine today is a Sauvignon Blanc, and our last wine is a Cabernet Franc. Sometime, probably around the 1700s, these two grape varieties came together and created a new variety called Cabernet Sauvignon. The promiscuous Cabernet Franc has also fathered several other offspring you might have heard of before, including Merlot, which we'll touch on later too. But enough with Love Island for grapes. Let's get going and crack into our first wine. The first wine is a Sauvignon Blanc. You've almost certainly heard of it and you've probably even drunk it before. It's one of the world's most popular grapes. It's a pretty old grape with slightly hazy origins, but most people think it originated in the Loire Valley in France at some point over the last thousand years and the Loire Valley is where we're gonna to head to now. If you want to give tasting a go yourself, this is a good time to pause and remember to keep a tiny bit of each wine back if you can, so we can compare all of the wines at the end of each section. All right. First up, taking a look at the wine, we are definitely looking at a pale lemon color. Next, a quick sniff to see what kind of intensity we have. I'd say this is probably a medium intensity. There's a few different aromas going on. There's definitely something there, but it's a little bit restrained and not too in your face powerful. Let's give it a swirl and see what aromas we can pick out. First up, wheel number one, and I feel like I'm getting quite a bit of lemon and lime maybe even some grapefruit from the citrus category. I'm also getting some gooseberry. You might not be familiar with this smell, but it's somewhere between a citrus and berry flavor. It's pretty common in Sauvignon Blanc. Moving on to the floral section. Should be getting some white flowers, maybe some elderflower. Also a little bit of freshly cut grass. And lastly, a bit of wet stone from the mineral section. That's a lot of aromas already, and we're only on the first wheel. That's actually where we're going to be staying for the time being, because Sauvignon Blanc is what's known as an aromatic grape. As the name suggests, this means a grape that gives us lots of aromas. And because of that, winemakers don't like to mess around with it too much. Most prefer to stick with the natural flavors and aromas that the grapes give us. So they use winemaking techniques to do this inert stainless steel tanks, and no oak barrel aging and so on. Now let's move on to the taste. Take a little sip and swoosh around your mouth to coat all your taste buds. You should find the body pretty light. 
Sauvignon Blanc is a naturally light grape, and because the winemakers aren't using things like oak maturation, we hold on to that natural lightness, which keeps it feeling fresh. Talking of fresh, you should be picking up some big acidity here too. Sauvignon Blanc is a really acidic grape, and it should be mouthwatering, acidic, and refreshing. Sweetness-wise, this is definitely dry. Although Sauvignon Blanc can make sweet wines too, it's often used in dessert wines. But generally speaking, it's good for people who want something crisp, dry, and refreshing. So what do we think about this wine? I think it's great. I mean, complexity-wise, there's quite a bit going on, despite us not having left the primary aroma wheel. It's well-balanced and has a nice long finish too. The only thing I'd say is lacking is a touch of intensity, but what do you think? Now that we've tasted the wine, let's find out some more about it. We mentioned earlier that Sauvignon Blanc most likely originates from the Loire Valley in France. The Loire is a long river, the longest in France, in fact, and it starts way down in the southeast in the hills around Ardèche. It winds its way through France and eventually makes its way out to the sea in the northwest. The river is 600 miles long which means while it's considered one region, it's actually broken up into chunks with each section having different climates, soils, and therefore different specialities and different grapes. The whole region has had a long history of winemaking, and that's partly because for about 400 years during medieval times, different cities along the Loire River were actually the capital cities of France. Capital cities means kings and queens, and that means lots of courtiers and nobles hanging around, which means there are plenty of banquets, creating a huge demand for wine. This led to the area taking off as a key wine region. Because of this, there's also a huge amount of castles and cathedrals in the area. So if you like looking at pretty buildings while drinking delicious wines, you could do a lot worse than taking a trip along the Loire. To give a quick overview of the main areas within the Loire Valley, we'll start at the Atlantic Ocean and work our way inland. First, we have the Pays Nantes. Around here, the main focus is on a white wine called Muscadet. Next up, we have Anjou Sommer, where they make a lot of wines from Chenin Blanc, including a sparkling wine called Cremant de Loire. They also make some red wines from Cabernet Franc and Gamay too. The next area is Touraine, the area around the city of Tours, where they grow lots of different grapes, Chenin Blanc, Cabernet Franc, Malbec, Gamay, Chardonnay, and our friend Sauvignon Blanc, but that's not where we're headed today. Keep going a little further upstream and you come to an area known as the Central Vineyards, or Upper Loire, and that's where our first wine is from. You might have heard of Sancerre or Puy Fumé before. These are the two prestigious regions in the Upper Loire area. And in typical French style, you probably won't see Sauvignon Blanc written anywhere on the label. Right now, we're drinking a Sancerre from this side of the river. But both these wines are produced in a similar style. They're acidic, fragrant because of the aromatic style of Sauvignon Blanc, and winemakers typically keep them fresh and try to keep the grapes' aromas and flavors at the forefront. Because of this, they're meant to be drunk young, usually within a couple of years of bottling while the aromas are nice and fresh. One of the reasons that these towns produce such great wines is because of the Loire River itself. Ordinarily, we'd be too far north for Sauvignon Blanc to ripen, but the river acts as a moderating influence. In the winter, it stops the area getting too cold and raises the temperature by a couple of degrees. And in the summer, it cools things down again. Again, just by a couple of degrees, meaning the conditions are just right. That gives us the sharp, fresh acidity of the cooler climate, but we don't need to worry so much about the grapes not ripening due to cold weather. These moderating influences are a big reason you'll find a lot of the best wine regions tend to spring up around bodies of water. Interestingly, despite winemaking in the Loire dating back to medieval times, Sauvignon Blanc itself is relatively new on the scene in Sancerre. Until the mid-1800s, they grew mainly Pinot Noir, but the vine root-eating bug called Phylloxera came along and wiped out almost all of these vines. The bug destroys the roots of a vine, 
by eating them and eventually kills the whole plant. But it wasn't just Sancerre that suffered. Between 1875 and 1890, French wine production dropped by over 70%, but the Pinot Noir vines in Sancerre were almost completely destroyed. After Phylloxera, when they replanted the vines in Sancerre, they opted for Sauvignon Blanc instead of Pinot because they thought it suited the climate better. And the results are what you've got in the glass. So do you think they made the right call planting Sauvignon Blanc instead? A lot of wine drinkers do, and in the last 40 years, the area of Sancerre that is planted with Sauvignon Blanc has more than tripled. Despite this increase in supply, demand is high too, so Sancerre and Puy Fumé both still come at a bit of a premium because the names are so prestigious. But you can get a decent bottle starting around 15 pounds. If you like this style, you should check out Menetou Salon and Cancy from the Loire Valley too, but a little further back from the river and not quite so prestigious or expensive. They both produce Sauvignon Blanc wines in a really similar style, but offer decent value for money. This would be a great drink on its own wine for a hot summer's day, especially if you were sitting on the terrace of a cafe by the River Loire. But if you started to get a bit peckish and were looking for something to pair it with, give goat's cheese a try, or seafood and white fish also go down a treat. Moving on to our next wine, we're going to check out another area famous for Sauvignon Blanc, and that's New Zealand. When we mentioned Sauvignon Blanc, New Zealand might have been one of the first places that sprang to mind. It's widely seen as the Sauvignon Blanc capital of the world, but the commercial winemaking history of Sauvignon Blanc in New Zealand is only about 40 years old. So why did it suddenly become so popular? Despite the fact that grapes have been grown in New Zealand since it was first colonized by Europeans in the 1800s, it wasn't until the 1970s that wine production started to take off. Firstly, drinking laws in New Zealand were crazily strict up until the 1960s. Pubs were only allowed to open for an hour at the end of a working day and had to close by six o'clock. Restaurants weren't licensed to sell alcohol at all. When this changed in the late 60s, suddenly commercial wine production was a more viable prospect. And in 1973, first vines were planted. And in 1979, they produced their first bottle of wine, a Sauvignon Blanc. Turns out that New Zealand, and particularly the region of Marlborough, are great for growing Sauvignon Blanc grapes. And so the wine started to gain popularity in the 80s and 90s, with a really unique style of Sauvignon Blanc unlike anything else being produced at the time. This made the region of Marlborough, which is situated at the top of the South Island, one of the most important areas for Sauvignon Blanc in the world. So let's break down what that style is. Open up wine number two, and we'll see how different it is from the classic French style we just tried. Now, you won't notice too many differences looking at the wine. We're still definitely on pale lemon, but give it a sniff and see if there's anything different from the first. You should get a much more powerful initial aroma out of this one. It's definitely got stronger intensity to it. Give it a swirl to release some of the aromas and see what you can find. So what can you pick out? Well, first and foremost, I get a big hit of tropical fruit flavors. Passion fruit sticks out the most for me, but perhaps a little mango too. New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs tend to have these big tropical aromas, which you don't often find with French wines like Sancerre. They come from chemical compounds called thiols, which are responsible for some of the aromas, and there are loads of them in New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs. We're not actually 100% sure why there are more thiols in New Zealand wine, but it's believed that the high number of sunlight hours and the high UV in New Zealand pay a big part, and they think that certain strains of yeast impact things too. These thiols are one of the really distinct things about New Zealand wines, and they're one of the reasons they're so popular. What do you reckon? Can you smell the difference between this one and the last one? One of the other most noticeable aromas that I get is a really strong bell pepper and cut grass scent. Again, this is something that pops up in a lot of Sauvignon Blancs, but is really common in New Zealand. These are another chemical compound called pyrazines. We had a grassiness in the last wine we drank, but they're even more powerful here. Some people love them and some people really don't like them. <laughs> 
Both these aromas together, the tropical fruit and the grassy bell pepper, are the key things that give New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc its distinctive style. You'll hopefully still get some elderflower in this wine, perhaps some green apple, some citrus, and maybe even some wet stone, similar to the last wine. Again, we're not going to move on to the second and third wheel because similar to Sancerre, the winemakers in New Zealand like to keep things fresh and fruity. Let's move on to taste and see what we think about this wine. You should hopefully be picking out some of the flavors that we sniffed. I get some of that tropical flavor, the citrus, and also definitely the green pepper too. What do you think about the characteristics, the structure of the wine? It's medium bodied, a little bit fuller than the last, and while there's not generally a huge amount of body with Sauvignon Blanc, this one is a little unusually seen the inside of an oak barrel, but it was a very large and very old one. That means that while there's a little more body to it, there aren't any vanilla or spice flavors. It's still fresh and fruity, and that higher concentration of flavor also helps to add to the body of wine. This is definitely a dry wine. While there's lots of tropical fruit, there's very little actual sugar. Lastly on acidity. Again, it's really acidic. It's really crisp and refreshing with an almost crunchy acidity to it, even with the oak softening that up a little. So what would we say about this wine? The balance is on point. There's a really powerful intensity and it's got a really long, pleasant finish too. Thinking about complexity, while we didn't leave the first wheel, it's still got a lot going on. I reckon we're looking at a decent wine, technically speaking. If you like this style, similar pairings to the last wine would still work. Fish and shellfish, as well as goat's cheese and poultry. But New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs also work really well with vegetarian dishes and pretty well with sushi too, which can sometimes be really tricky to pair with wine. So what exactly are we drinking? Well, it comes from an estate called Yeelands in Marlborough. They make wines from a regular Sauvignon Blanc you can buy in Sainsbury's for eight pounds a bottle, all the way up to this, which is their winemaker's reserve. It's made from their best grapes, grown in their best sites, but you can find it for a still rather reasonable 17 pounds a bottle. The vineyard is completely sustainable and is actually one of the leaders of the sustainability movement in New Zealand. They use lots of clever natural methods to allow them to cut down on their use of pesticides and chemicals. They use solar, wind, and even burn vines to help provide power for the winery and produce all of their own compost, which they use to fertilize the vines. All around, it is a sustainable paradise, and more and more vineyards around the world are adopting some of these practices as they reduce their reliance on nasty chemicals. Sauvignon Blanc is the most popular wine in New Zealand, and the majority are produced in a similar style to this. It's a good example, but you could walk into pretty much any supermarket or off-license and pick up something not too dissimilar. The rise of New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs has been meteoric, but this is actually starting to cause a small amount of concern among the producers. If all the styles are so similar, people will often just pick the cheapest option. And what if this New Zealand style falls out of fashion? Wine is susceptible to trends just like everything else. Because of this, winemakers are starting to experiment with more ways to make their wines more distinct. A focus on regionality is becoming more important to help draw distinctions between Marlborough and the country's other Sauvignon Blanc producing regions. This wine label, for example, lists the Atawara Valley, the subregion first, followed by the wider main Marlborough region. While Sauvignon Blanc is the grape that put New Zealand on the map, there are increasingly high quality plantings of other varieties such as Riesling, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay and Syrah in different areas around the country. Some winemakers, like these guys, are experimenting with the use of oak to offer something different. And some are even playing around with whether the wine can stand up to oak aging. It's still early days for all of these experiments. And one of the problems with wine is that there are often no shortcuts to these experiments, and some can even take years or decades. One of the really interesting things about New Zealand is that they're not held back by winemaking rules like many European countries. So there's an experimental attitude and approach to their winemaking. They've had a cracking start, but we're still at the very beginning of New Zealand's winemaking story. And we're likely to see some really exciting wines over the next few years. 
We're now going to jump from a very contemporary region over to a very historic one. We're going back to France and this time to Bordeaux. Bordeaux, alongside Champagne and Burgundy, is probably one of the most famous wine regions in the whole world. We'll check out some of the red wines very shortly. But in a region so famous for red wine, you might also be surprised to know that they make white wines too. About 10% of the region is white. While Sauvignon Blanc is thought to have come from the Loire, very early on it found its way down to Bordeaux. While in the Loire and New Zealand, they tend to keep things focused on single varietal wines, meaning one grape, which maintains the flowery and fruity characteristics of Sauvignon Blanc. In Bordeaux, they like to do things a little differently and tend to put their Sauvignon Blancs in blends. So what's the other ingredient? Well, it's a grape called Semillon. You might have heard of it before. In Bordeaux, these blended wines can be made in a sweet style, usually with more Semillon, or a dry style with more Sauvignon. The sweet styles of a region are very famous. You've maybe heard of Sauternes or Barsac. For today, we're focusing on dry wines. So let's dive in and see what kind of flavor we can expect from these dry blended wines and what Semillon brings to the table. Open up your third white wine and pop it in the glass. First off, we're gonna take a look at the color. I think we're still on lemon, but it's a tiny bit deeper than the first two. I reckon we could almost call this a medium lemon color. Does that give you any clues as to what might be coming next? Next up, give it a sniff. I think we can say it's a pretty intense aroma. We'll give it a swirl to open it up and see what we can find. You know the drill. Pause if you want to have a go yourself before we move on. Okay, so let's start off with some of the things you might recognize from the last two wines. Do you get any lemon or gooseberry from the Sauvignon Blanc? I get some of those aromas, but also some apple too. It's not like that crisp green apple we had earlier. I think it's more like a yellow apple, maybe more like a golden delicious. Because this wine is still mainly Sauvignon Blanc, we get a lot of these primary aromas coming through from the aromatic grape. Anything else you can pick up? What if I told you this wine was aged partly in new oak barrels? I really get some of these oak flavors coming through. Some clove, a little bit of vanilla and baking spices, and some toast. I also get some subtle hints of honey and nuttiness coming through. Also a kind of like a waxiness, perhaps beeswax, which is really common with the grape Semillon. Let's have a taste and see if we can pick out any of these on the palate. So can you pick up any of these flavors? I'd say I definitely get the apple and the gooseberry still, and I can really pick out the oak flavors. As well, there's that beeswax. It almost has a waxy texture on the palate. It's a lot fuller bodied than the last two. I probably would go to medium to full with this. It's a little bit richer. The style in Bordeaux is generally to age their white wines in oak barrels before bottling, which contributes to this. Sauvignon Blanc is quite fresh and light bodied and doesn't typically go well with the rich characteristics and aromas that the oak can impart in a wine. Semillon is a slightly lower acidity and heavier bodied grape which allows it to pair quite nicely with these oaky characteristics. And the oak itself also adds some more body and flavor to the wine. This is still definitely a dry wine, so let's whiz past sweetness, but moving on to acidity, we'll stop to pick this apart a bit. You can hopefully detect that it's still acidic. It's still got that mouth-watering feel, but because of the semillon, this is reduced ever so slightly. As well as the different grape variety making the acidity a little bit lower, the oak maturation helps to soften this too. So how would our food pairing differ for the slightly more robust flavors and fuller body? Well, if you're looking for food to pair it with, it can stand up to slightly more robust dishes. As well as poultry, like a rich buttery chicken dish with lots of crispy skin, you could also have this wine with roast pork. Or cheese is always a good shout, and because it's not quite so delicate, it can stand up to some of the stinkier stuff. This wine comes from a region called Pesac Lyonian, or right in the suburbs of the city of Bordeaux. You could walk from the center of Bordeaux to the Pesac vineyards in about 35 minutes. 
While white wines are made throughout the Bordeaux region, these ones are considered the most prestigious. So if you're a fan of its style, look out for Pessac Lyonnais on the label. This chateau, La Morphe Buscar, is really, really old and has been making wines since the 12th century. So you've had a lot of time to perfect their style. If you're a fan of this style, then check out some of the Australian Semillon Sauvignon blends from the Hunter Valley, as they're made in a pretty similar way. Both the wines from Pessac and from Hunter Valley can usually stand up to a bit of aging. So depending on the age, you often get some of these delicious tertiary aromas and flavors coming through too. Okay now, before we move on to the reds, let's take a quick look back at the white wines and see what we've learned so far. This is a good time to go back and compare them all in quick succession. Sometimes that makes comparing them a little easier. We started off with a Sancerre, a Sauvignon Blanc from France. This was acidic and crisp with some brilliant primary fruit and flower flavors, but with a restraint and subtlety that's common in the Sauvignon Blancs from the Loire Valley. Next up, we moved on to the more powerful and in your face New Zealand wine and started to pick out more of a tropical fruit as well as bell pepper flavors that comes out in Sauvignon Blancs from this region. Lastly, we moved on to our Bordeaux white blend, a mix of Sauvignon and Semillon that shows how you can keep some of the fresh fruit and acidity of Sauvignon Blanc, but bulk out the body a bit by making it heavy and bringing some new flavors and interesting textures from the oak. So what did you think? Did you have a favorite? If you're a fan of the Sancerre style, you're probably safer staying in the Loire. And again, the New Zealand style is really distinct, but a lot of areas, particularly in Australia, South Africa, and North and South America are trying to mimic this style too. So maybe give them a try. If you like the Bordeaux blend, there's a few different options from this area. Generic Bordeaux Blancs will be made in a similar style, but won't be so heavily oaked or stand up so well to aging. Alternatively, if you shoot over to Australia in Hunter Valley, they're big fans of the Semillon Sauvignon mix here. We're now going to move on to red wines. And if you have any white wines left over, feel free to finish them now, as we won't be starting our first red for a couple of minutes. If you have enough glasses, perhaps pour out wines four and five now to start giving them some air while we give you a little Bordeaux history lesson. Wine production in Bordeaux, like in Burgundy, dates back to the Roman times, so they've been making wine here for about 2,000 years and have quite a lot of experience. Their wine was always popular domestically in its home region of Aquitaine and across the rest of France too, but it wasn't until the 12th century when it started to be exported to other markets. Eleanor of Aquitaine, the Duchess of the region, which at the time was the largest and wealthiest in France, married a man called Henry, who two years later was crowned the King of England, becoming Henry II and making the big wealthy region of Aquitaine essentially English. This led to the wines of Bordeaux becoming very popular with the English, and the proximity to the coast made exporting them to England easy. Back in the day, transporting large amounts of wine by road was a pain, due to wooden cartwheels coupled with rubbish roads, so any areas that had easy access to the big wide rivers or the sea had a big advantage in exporting their wines. In fact, many of what we see as the classic wine regions today, Bordeaux, Burgundy, Champagne, and the main German regions, for example, all have easy access to a network of wide, slow-moving rivers that have made exporting wines to other regions or countries relatively straightforward. More exports meant more money for the producers, which in turn drove innovation, improving the quality of the wines, which drove even more growth and enhanced their reputations. This is another reason we see so many of the best wine regions springing up around rivers. But back to Bordeaux in the Middle Ages, and the wine that was being exported to the UK back then was very different to what you've got in your glasses today. It was called Claret, and it was a light flavored dark pink wine very different from what people imagine when they think of Bordeaux today. Over time, Claret became anglicized to Claret, a name that stuck, and since the Middle Ages, it has been an English nickname that now refers to a red wine from Bordeaux. The Claret wine was shipped over to England in large barrels called tons, which is coincidentally where the word ton comes from, because one of these filled to the brim with wine weighs about a thousand kilos or a ton. Because winemaking goes back so far, the Bordeaux region is steeped in history and tradition, 
which means there are a lot of archaic laws, labeling systems, and classifications, which can all make Bordeaux seem a little bit intimidating with confusing terminology, pictures of fancy chateau, gold leafing, and elaborate fonts on the labels. But let's put all this to one side for a second because an easier way to figure out Bordeaux is to learn how the geography of the area affects which grapes are likely to be in the wine, and therefore, how it's likely to taste. The three main grapes featured in Red Bordeaux are Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, and Cabernet Franc. There are a couple of others that play supporting roles, but we won't worry about those for today. While all these grapes are permitted everywhere, some of them fare better in certain areas. Despite the many different subregions in Bordeaux, broadly speaking, the two key areas for red wines are known as the left bank here and the right bank, which is this area here. The estuary that joins the sea splits into two rivers, the Garonne and the Dordogne. The area to the west, or to the left of the Garonne River, is known as the left bank, and the area to the right, or the east of the Dordogne, is known as the right bank. To start with, we're going to go to the left bank, and the focus here is on Cabernet Sauvignon. But let's pour out both for now if you can, and you might want to have your snacks ready for this bit. Looking at this wine, it has a really, really deep color intensity. If you looked at this over a sheet of white paper, you'll be able to see that it's still ruby by looking around the thin part of the rim. But you can hardly see anything through the thicker part. And that tells us it's likely to be quite full bodied. Stick your nose in and see what you think of the intensity. You hardly have to stick your nose in. This one has definitely got high intensity. Let's give it a swirl, get some oxygen in, and have a proper sniff. I get lots of different aromas here on the nose. It's almost a bit overwhelming. There's so much going on. Maybe take your time and pause here to see if you can pick it apart. First up, on the first wheel, let's head to the black fruit section. I'm getting what smells like cassis or neat Ribena, so that would be blackcurrant. But I'm also getting some blackberry and also some black plum flavors. Staying with the first wheel, I'm getting a really powerful vegetable aroma too. I think you could almost say like tomato leaf or blackcurrant leaf and green bell pepper. Cabernet Sauvignon is the offspring of Sauvignon Blanc. And the same chemical compound, pyrazines, that we detected earlier in New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs, coming through here in those vegetal flavors. Let's move along to wheel number two and see what we've got here. I don't know about you, but I'm getting lots of toast, a lot of clove and some smoke. This wine has clearly seen some new oak and those flavors are really coming out in the wine. That toastiness and vanilla come together really nicely with the black fruit and almost smells like an autumn crumble. Is there anything else you can pick out? Maybe from the third wheel? This wine has five or six years on it, so it should be starting to develop some tertiary aromas. There's a kind of musty smell going on here. I think kind of leathery is a good term for it. But there's also a bit of mushroom, maybe some leafy forest floor aromas as well. Kind of like being huddled around a campfire in a damp wood in the autumn. Lastly, I get some dried fruit some prune perhaps, which makes sense as we smelled fresh plum in the primary aromas. So over time, it's likely to morph into prune aromas as the wine starts to age. Okay, on to the next bit and we're gonna taste. So give the glass a swirl and sip and swoosh around your mouth. So what do you think? Pretty powerful stuff, huh? How about we break it down and see what we can pick out and start to understand from it. Firstly, I think we've got to go full bodied and then some. It's really thick, rich and heavy. Next up on the tannins. These should be through the roof. You should almost be able to pick them out with your teeth. Sweetness wise, this is definitely dry, 
and acidity wise, even though it might be a bit tricky to pick it out with all the other richness in the tannin, the acidity is high as well. You should feel your mouth watering as you drink it, almost as quickly as the tannins are taking it away. If the tannins are a bit much for you, take a bite of one of your snacks. Because the tannins like to bind to protein, having a bite to eat will help them bind to the food, and that makes the wine a bit easier to drink. Because of the high proportion of Cabernet in this wine, the finished wine has really heavy tannins. Tannins help to preserve the wine as it ages. So some high tannin wines can last for years and years. This wine already has about five years of age and could do another eight or so before it reaches its peak. But some of the really premium left bank wines are capable of aging for over 20 years before they even hit their stride. So what do you think of the wine? Technically speaking, it's great. There's a super powerful intensity, it's hugely complex, and the balance and the finish are great too. Personally speaking though, I find left bank Bordeaux wines a bit much. They're more fun to smell for me than they are to taste. Unless I'm eating a massive rib of beef or something equally hearty, the tannins can be a bit much. But everyone has different tastes, so you might love it. Food-wise, even though we smelt some autumn crumble aromas, please do not try and drink it with that. Dry, heavy, big tannin wines like this do not pair at all with sweet dishes. You're better off enjoying some cheese while you finish the bottle and moving to something sweet when it's time for dessert. So where is this wine from more precisely? Well, we've already covered that it's from the left bank, which is the general name for the area that runs along the Garonne River from Grave in the south to Medoc in the north. Along the way, you go through a few areas you might have heard of. First Sautern, then Barsac, two areas that make fab dessert wines from a Semillon and Sauvignon blend. Then Passac Lyonien, which is where the Bordeaux Blanc we drank earlier is from. Then you have Bordeaux City itself, then Haute Medoc, Margot, Saint-Julien, Puyac, and saint Estef before you get to the Medoc in the north, and then the sea. The original Bordeaux region, where they were making all that dark pink claret back in medieval times, was actually this area south of the city called Grave. Grave takes its name from the really gravelly soils here. But that soil actually runs all the way along the riverbank and is what these left bank areas have in common. Cabernet Sauvignon struggles to ripen in cool climates. However, the gravel and the pebbles in the soil retain heat at night and then reflect sunlight back during the day, which means that the left bank is a fair amount warmer than the rest of the region. That's why on the left bank, the wines are really heavy on Cabernet Sauvignon. And while there are obviously still big differences between the wines, they're all relatively similar in style. This wine is from saint Estef, one of the very prestigious areas in the Medoc to the north of the city of Bordeaux. Despite it not being in the Grave area, the chateau is actually called Grave de Pez, highlighting just how gravelly the soil is. True to left bank form, it's mainly Cabernet Sauvignon. It's about 70% with 30% Merlot to soften it up a touch. While there are a lot of very premium chateaux in the area of saint Estef, where you'll be paying upwards of 150 pounds a bottle, this is a more modest producer. The owner, Maxime Saint-Martin, took it over when he was just 21, and the chateau was awarded the Cru Artisan classification 10 years later. Cru Artisan is a title reserved for smaller producers, making consistently good wines, and Maxime Saint-Martin is actually one of the youngest producers to receive the accolade. You'd expect to pay about £30 a bottle in the shop, so what do you reckon? Is it worth it? Leave a bit of this first wine in your glasses, or tip it back into the bottle for safekeeping if you need, and let's move on to our next glass. So for this one, we're hopping over from the left bank to the right bank. On the right bank of the other river, the Dordogne, they generally don't have the gravelly soils like they do on the left bank. You're more likely to find sand, clay, and limestone. And because of this, the grapes they use change. These soils won't work so well with Cabernet Sauvignon because they don't give the extra temperature boost. So while they still use a small amount of Cabernet Sauvignon in these wines, 
it features less heavily on the ripe bank because it struggles to ripen. Instead, the main grapes are Merlot and Cabernet Franc, which thrive in the soils over here. So, should we dig in and see how the different grapes change the final wine? Looks-wise, I don't think very much has changed at all. We're still very, very deep intensity-wise, and we are still ruby-coloured. Intensity-wise, I think we're still very high. Again, this would be what we call pronounced. Can you pick out any different flavours this time? I still get that black plum and the black currant. Maybe some black cherry too, but I'm also picking out a bit of breadfruit as well. Can you smell any red plum or perhaps red cherry? Maybe some other ripe red fruits? These red fruit characteristics are what Merlot and Cabernet Franc bring to the table, which are actually the only two grapes in this wine. Finally, do you get any of that green pepper or grassy note? That's coming from the Cabernet Franc that's in the mix, but more on that when we move to our next wine. Moving on to the second wheel, I think the toast and smoke are still there. Again, they have used some new oak when making this wine, which brings those oaky and smoky flavours out. Lastly, I'm getting some similar aromas to the first, of leather, mushroom and forest floor coming through. This wine's also had a few years of age on it, which helps to bring some of those aromas out. Aroma-wise, there are definitely some new aromas, but we're in a similar ballpark to the other wine. You can hopefully still tell that this wine comes from the same overall region as the last, but hopefully smell some of the differences too. Let's have a sip now and see if we can taste any differences. Again, pretty similar flavour-wise to what we were smelling, but I get a lot more fruitiness here from the red fruit, adding a little bit more depth to the pure black fruit we had before. Perhaps there's a little bit more toast, but less spice than the last. If we break down the flavour characteristics, I think this is where we might pick out some differences. I'm still getting a really full body. This is definitely still a big wine, but it's perhaps a touch softer than the last. The tannins are still present, but perhaps a bit more approachable. That's partly the Cabernet Franc in the mix, which is a slightly less tannic grape than the Cabernet Sauvignon, and partly the Merlot, which still has tannins, but they're softer tannins, which makes the ripe bank wines a little bit less harsh and astringent. It's still really acidic and dry, so pretty similar in those areas, and it's still a really big wine. High intensity, really complex, well-balanced, and with a really long finish. Do you have a preference between the two? Some people really like one, not the other. Some people can't get enough of both, and some people can't stand either. I definitely say this one is my preference between the two, but some people love the bold tannins and power of the first. It's all down to personal preference, but have a think about which bits you do and don't like as understanding and being able to explain this will help you get much better recommendations in restaurants and wine shops. If you're into this wine more than the first, chances are you like right bank wines. And the good news for you is that you only need to remember two places, Saint-Emilion and Pomerol. Both these areas focus on Merlot wines. The lack of gravelly soil makes the area cooler which makes Cabernet Sauvignon harder to ripen. Again, both areas have some incredibly premium chateaus that fetch thousands of pounds a bottle and can be aged for 40 years or more, but there is a big range of quality in Bordeaux. While chateau technically means castle, palace, or manor house, the term is used relatively loosely. That means there are actually 6,000 chateaux in the Bordeaux region. If you try a specific wine and love it, remember the name, but you could waste a lot of energy trying to remember all these individual chateau names. Although, as with everything in wine, some people do. Having so many chateaux is one of the reasons there are some confusing classification systems to try and make sense of it all. But as is often the way, Hundreds of years of different systems being phased in and out and layered on top of one another has actually made things super confusing. 
For a start, there are five different classification systems. Not five different classifications or five levels of hierarchy. It's five whole different systems, some of which have multiple levels within them. For anyone who found the burgundy labeling system a little bit complicated, this would really blow your mind. Don't worry, we are not going to go into detail. Just enough to get familiar with it and make sense of some of the terms you'll be seeing on Bordeaux bottles. The main one that people talk about is something called the 1855 classification. This took place in, you guessed it, 1855. And the aim was to rank the best chateau at the time. 60 red wine producing chateaus on the left bank were ranked into five different quality levels. Premier Cru or First Growth, Deuxième Cru or Second Growth, and so on until you get to the Fifth Growths. Even more confusingly, the First Growths or Premier Crus don't mean the same thing as in the region of Burgundy. While both are an indication of quality, it's a totally different system for Bordeaux and Burgundy. If you're not sure if you're drinking Bordeaux or Burgundy, check the bottle out. Burgundy will always be this shape, and Bordeaux will always be this shape. Any of the 60 chateaux at any level of the 1855 classification get to write Grand Cru Classe on their labels, which is a very prestigious term. Even for level five, they'll start at around 40 pounds a bottle in a shop or up to hundreds or thousands for the ultra premium first groves or premier Cru wines. Since 1855, there's only been a single change in the ranking, which makes the list a little controversial. They're basically saying that over 160 years, all these chateaux are still the best and in exactly the same order. Because the list doesn't change, and because it only took into account 1% of all of the chateaux, a couple of other systems have sprung up over the years. Cru Bourgeois is one, and Cru Artisan that we mentioned earlier is another. These systems are slightly less prestigious, although the lists are reviewed regularly. Also, because these classifications only apply to the Medoc area north of Bordeaux, there are more classifications that apply to the other areas, such as saint emilion in the right bank and Grave to the south of Bordeaux city. The most important bits of all this are to know that if a label says any of these, basically anything with Cru Class A, then it's likely to be fairly expensive and hopefully will be very good, but no promises. If it says Cru Bourgeois or Cru Artisan on it, you can be fairly sure that it's going to be pretty good too, and hopefully from a producer that isn't resting on their laurels or a 200-year-old scoring system. If it says anything else, Bordeaux Superior, for example, it doesn't really mean a huge amount. It just guarantees a certain alcohol level. And Grand Vin de Bordeaux just means it's the best wine that a producer makes. Both of these, as well as Cote de Bordeaux and generic Bordeaux AOC wines, can still be really good, but they're from less prestigious areas. So even though Bordeaux Superior sounds fancy, do some research if you're keen to find an amazing value hidden gem. If those classifications have left you even more confused than when we started, just try and figure out whether you like left bank or right bank wines. If you see a wine on the list, you can just Google the chateau name and see whether it's here, meaning Cabernet Sauvignon heavy with bigger tannins and more spice, or if it's here, it's probably got more Merlot and Cabernet Franc and is a little fruitier and rounder with slightly softer tannins. If you want to check out some more Cabernet Sauvignons and big Bordeaux style wines, the world is pretty much your oyster. Pretty much everywhere hot and warm grows Cabernet Sauvignon. In the south of France, they use it a lot, in Italy, a lot in Tuscany, in a specific type of wine called the Super Tuscans, which are usually blends of a few varieties. In the USA, sunny California is great for big and highly alcoholic wines, generally referred to as cabs. South Africa makes some great Cabernet-focused wines in Swartland and Stellenbosch. Southern Australia also makes some good examples with big black plum and chocolate flavors. Basically, everywhere warm makes Cabernet Sauvignon wines. And as you get warmer, you're likely to get pure 100% Cabernet Sauvignon wines because the grapes find it easier to ripen 
So you don't need to add so much Merlot into the mix to soften out some of those astringent flavors. Now, if you want to finish up those two wines, we're done with Bordeaux for now. And we're going to head back to where we started today's lesson in the Loire. When we talked earlier about the Loire, we mentioned the region of Touraine. This is in the middle part. This region produces quite a few different grapes, but the main red grape here is Cabernet Franc. Within this part of the region, there are a few different sub-appellations. Two of these, Bourgogne and Chinon, are known for making some of the best red wines in the Loire Valley. And this next wine is from Bourgogne, this area north of the river. While Cabernet Franc is the parent of Cabernet Sauvignon, it took grape scientists a while to realize these grapes were related. Nobody thought that such a dark grape with thick skins like Cabernet Sauvignon could have one parent that was a white grape, Sauvignon Blanc, and one parent with thin skins, Cabernet Franc. So while there are definitely going to be some similarities between this grape and Cabernet Sauvignon, there are likely to be some big differences too. So let's open up our Cabernet Franc and see what we can pick apart. <laughs> Firstly, can you notice anything color-wise? I think we're still on ruby, but probably not a deep ruby anymore. It's a little bit paler, maybe medium. As we just mentioned, the grape has thinner skins, which means there's less color to extract when they make the wine. This leads to a lighter colored wine. So let's have a sniff. I think the intensity is still definitely high or pronounced. Are there any specific aromas that you can pick up on? It's definitely in the red fruit category. There's some red currant and maybe some red cherries, even a little bit of strawberry there too. These red fruit flavors tend to come with slightly lighter wines, whereas the dark fruit flavors tend to come with heavier, fuller bodied wines. It doesn't work 100% of the time, but the paler color helps give us a hint about what might be coming up. Next up, I'd say there's definitely some vegetal aromas. There's some of that bell pepper and black currant leaf. We got some really big green pepper, grassy aromas with the Cabernet Sauvignon and the Sauvignon Blanc. So it makes sense that the Cabernet Franc has this characteristic as well. One big, happy, grassy, peppery family of grapes. Can you smell any oak or wood characteristics? I don't get much in that department. I think that's because they've used older oak making this wine, which imparts less of the vanilla and the smoke. It's giving a little bit of spiciness, but the fruit and the pepper flavors are really the predominant ones here for me. Now, let's take a sip and see how it compares. And the flavor of those red berries is really coming through, which is partnered with that really high acidity that's giving it a sharp fruity flavor. While the wine is much lighter bodied anyway, probably medium, this fresh acidity and red fruit is really helping to make it even fresher for me. What do you think about the tannins? They're definitely still there. And while this would still be a high tannin wine, they're a bit more delicate and lighter than the last one, a bit less bitter. Lastly, what do you think about the finish? It leaves a really pleasant taste, but I'd say it's definitely shorter than the last two we drank. It fades away more quickly. For me, this wine is definitely a light refreshing break after the two very heavy Bordeaux reds. This area of Bourgogne is to the north of the Loire, and around here, there are plenty of smaller, family-run, more independent vineyards. Not so many castles, but lots of charming farmhouses. The general style is for the wines from this appellation specifically to be a little bit more structured and higher in tannin than your average Cabernet Franc. Normally, Cabernet Franc from the Loire is relatively low in tannin, but because the soil in Bourgogne is a little bit more gravelly, similar to Bordeaux, it retains the heat and allows the grapes to ripen properly. The gravel retains and reflects heat, which means slightly thicker skins on this thin-skinned grape, which leads to higher tannin. 
If you're looking for something with a bit less structure or tannin, check out the appellation of Chinon, just the other side of the river from Bourgoy. The wine is from a producer called Bertrand Galbron, and he has a small holding of vines, but he manages pretty much himself with minimal help. He's a real farmer, and his wines are biodynamic, which is a farming practice similar in many ways to organics. He likes to intervene as little as possible in the vineyard and the winery too, so his wines have this really great expression of fruit, because he limits winemaking techniques that might distract from this. So what do you reckon about Cabernet Franc? If you like this sharp, fruity variety, check out some of the other wines that Loire has to offer. This area Bourgoy and nearby Saumur Champigny and Chinon are considered the best in the Loire for this grape. Despite the fact that Cabernet Franc has been around longer than any of the other grapes we've tried today, it's managed to keep a relatively low profile as a single varietal wine and tends to end up in blends a lot of the time, even though that's starting to change. It's worth checking out the Sierra foothills in California, as well as in the Colchagua Valley in Chile, if you're looking for something that's better value. But Cabernet Franc wines from the Loire can be pretty affordable. You can get some really great wines from here from around 10 to 30 pounds. Cabernet Franc is fantastic with food because of the acidity, but also because of the tannins it can offer up too. It works really well with other acidic flavors like tomato sauces, but also works surprisingly well with seared, grilled, and barbecued meats. The other good thing about this grape is because of the freshness. You can drink the wine slightly chilled, so great wine for a barbecue on a hot day when you want something that isn't too heavy, but can still stand up to strong meaty flavors while not overwhelming vegetarian dishes either. So what did you think about today's red wines? Are you more of a fan of the big, bold, spicy, tannic left bank Bordeaux's or the slightly rounder and fruitier right bank? Perhaps the even more refreshing sharp fruit characteristics from the pure Cabernet Franc were more up your alley. Let's do a quick recap of everything we covered today while you finish any wine you've got left. We started with white wines in the Loire Valley and a Sancerre, a restrained expression of Sauvignon Blanc similar in style to their neighbor Puy Fumé. Then we shot to the other side of the world where we drank some New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc and discovered the unique style of wine they produce here with sharp acidity, and passion fruit and green pepper flavors a style that has made this region so trendy for the past 20 to 30 years. Then we went to Bordeaux to Pessac Lyonnais for something a little heavier, where the introduction of Semillon into the mix and the use of oak gave us a much richer, fuller bodied wine that would be able to stand up to some aging, unlike most Sauvignon Blanc wines. Then moving on to red wines, we stuck around in Bordeaux, hopefully giving you an idea of the big, bold, spicy tannic style of the region's red wines generally. We looked at how the Cabernet Sauvignon heavy styles on the left bank took this to the extremes, whereas the right bank styles more focused on Merlot and Cabernet Franc were slightly softer, rounder examples with a bit more fruit. Finally, we wound our way back to where we started in the Loire Valley, where we drank some pure Cabernet Franc and found a lot of the sharp red berry and red fruit characteristics that make this wine such a great choice with food. So did you find any new wines you like from today's lineup? Or did you figure out some elements that you now know to look for in a wine? Even if there are bits you don't like, that's really great for helping you to find better wines. That's all from us today, but if you have any questions, drop us an email and follow us on Instagram for more wine, tips, tricks, and pictures of nice vineyards and castles. Cheers, and see you soon.